لو قطعوا ارجلنا واليدين نأتيك زحفا سيدي يا حسين I will come crawling to you Hussein I will come crawling to you Hussein They can cut my arms and my legs They can take everything that I have I will come crawling to you Hussein I will come crawling أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي أرفني نفسها ولم يتركني أميانا القل والحمد لله الذي جعلني من أمتي سيد المرسلين قاتم النبيين طه وياسين أحمد محمود أبو القاسم محمد ومن المحبين إطرة التاهرين لانة الدائمي من الآن إلى يوم الدين على أدائهم أما بعد كان الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفركانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وتعاونوا على البر والتقوى ولا تعاونوا على الاسم والعدوان صلوات We're in continuing with the theme The overarching theme is that can we as the Muslim Ummah reclaim our rightful place in this world as a civilizing force as we had experienced during the time of the Blessed Prophet and the time of Aymar al And tonight we have the fourth presentation in the series where I'd like to talk about rising to our full potential of our humanness by living with a purpose. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِي That we have created you, or we have created man, insan, in the best of molds. The Mufassirin talk about a mold. You know when you have an injection molding machine, you create a mold and suddenly a beautiful piece of crockery or something comes out. It's that mold that we are talking about that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created insan in the best of molds and when we are going to pour our character, our iman, our way of life into it, a beautiful life emerges. This is the potential of a human being where Allah promises that we have been created in the best of molds. And we are reminded of the great words of Mawlai Muttaqiyan Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. When he gave this explanation of the superiority of the human being above the angels. And he explained, and this has been expounded beautifully by Sheikh Naraki in his book Jamiu Saada where he talks about this whole thing, but Imam, in just a few words, expounded this idea of the human being being better than the angels. At the same time, it could be worse than the animals. How? That we, as humans, have been gifted with the faculties and the powers which the angels have not. The angels have the power of intellect, but the angels don't have the powers of what they call kuwai gazabiya and kuwai shahabiya, the power of desire and the power of anger. And Naraki, Sheikh Naraki, adds kuwai wahamiya, the 
faculty of creativity in a human being that he has been given. So the angels have intellect, but they don't have the shout, the carnal desires or the desire of possession and the desire of anger. While the animals have not been given the power of intellect, but they have been given the power of anger and the power of possession or kuai shaviya, the power of carnal desire, so they are able to procreate. Now, a human being having to control the power of ghazab, the power of anger and the power of shahwa, the power of carnal desires, allows his intellect to rule supreme, he can be better than the angels because the angels doesn't have these handicaps of having carnal desires and the power of anger. And the animals have those two powers, Imam exclaims, but they don't have the power of akal and therefore they will move by their instinct and they will move to try and protect themselves through the power of anger, the power of, or the instinct of self-survival, the instinct of procreation, but they don't have the intellect. So a human being, by being a good human being, when he allows his akal, his intellect, his critical thinking, his mode of using his mind in a correct way, can be better than an angel because he's been able to control the other desires. But having been given and blessed with the power of intellect, if he slides down that road that the animals do, then he can be worse than the animals. So this is our journey as human beings. That are we worse than the animals? If we do not allow our akal to control the other faculties, or are we better than the angels because we have controlled those faculties and we have come out on our own. Inshallah we pray that Allah gives us that tawfiq to all of us and to all humanity to be worthy of living their full potential of the humanness which Allah has granted us. Salawat. So in order to move in that path and to continue with the session, that there is one core thing when you talk about living with a purpose, that you where you begin. They say a journey of a thousand steps begins with the first step. And before you even take the first step, niya, the intention for any ibadah, you stand up for prayers, it's a prerequisite that you consciously say to yourself, you don't have to utter the words necessarily, but you consciously tell yourself that I stand before my maker for his pleasure in his obedience. That is the meaning of niya. And the niya needs to proceed, proceed every significant act or intention. And this becomes so very important for a human being to move through that path of reaching his or her humanness. Because when you make a niya, you get out of the, uh, of the house in the morning, sit behind your wheel, and you start driving. You have a full tank of gas. You have the best car in the world. You have the best of the roads uh, you know, on the planet, and you go. You haven't made a niya of where to go. You're going to end up finishing the gas running out of time and at the end of the day probably ruining the car and unnecessarily using the government's roads because you achieve nothing. The idea is to have that niya as you begin to say that it implies that I am conscious as a human being, as a thinking animal. I have now made a conscious choice and the same thing is with life. I was brought into this world with the blessings of my parents. I was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now that I am here, if I am to live my life 
and achieve the full potential of my humanness, then I have to make that niya of living my life intentionally. And that is what this is all about. Because an action, al amalu bin niya. An action is evaluated by the intention that precedes it. Every action, good or bad, also depends on the niya that you actually make. And a niya can elevate you or it can demote you. There were three men who were working on a building site, all doing the same work, building. And one of them was asked to say, what are you doing? He said, I'm making bricks. I'm making bricks. The second man doing exactly the same job was asked to say, what are you doing? And he said, I'm earning a living for my family. You can see that his intention, his thinking, his intellect was elevated from merely somebody who does not see beyond his nose to say, I'm making this brick, to a bigger purpose, saying, I'm earning a living for my family. He turned the idea of making bricks into a part of worship because earning a halal living for your family is part and parcel of worship. And then the third man was asked to say, what are you doing? And they were working on a, on a mosque building site. And he said, I am building the house of God. You can see how near and the intention and the thinking behind that intention elevated the third person even higher to say that I am doing something beyond for what I'm doing for myself, but I'm doing it for a bigger cause. I'm doing it for humanity at large. This is the meaning of the correct thinking and critical thinking. At the same time, a niya can also demote one. Abu Huraira, who is famous for fabricating a hadith. Huraira actually means cat, and Abu Huraira means the father of cat. And Abu Huraira was once asked by a trader, by a merchant, that you have to save my business, I'm in trouble. Somebody told me that next year there was going to be a problem with the supply of onions and I've got a store full of onions. No one's buying my onions. And the temperature here in the place where I live called Akka are going up and all my onions are rotting. Can you please help me? And Abu Huraira says, come to Makkah at a particular time after prayers and I'll solve your problem. And then when the time comes, people are leaving after prayers. Abu Huraira stops everywhere and said, I have a hadith that I want to share with you. And he said that whoever smells the onions of Akka in Makkah will smell Jannah. <laughs> and all the onions were sold, of course. The point is, Abu Huraira helped, I don't know what his commission was, by the way, but all his intention was to save to save someone, someone's business in the process, he fabricated a hadith of the Blessed Prophet. And this is where sometimes we have a niya of doing something and we go into this idea of the end justifying the means. And we can see that how thinking and action are related and this is where niya becomes central to our practice and our faith. Therefore, no intention, no action can truly be taken unless you have a niya and you're going to be with that niya. And this thing that you have in your heart is indeed called the niya. And the niya again, for the same use of the same thing, can be good or bad. And from now, by now you must have figured out that I like Chanel number no. 5 as a perfume. <laughs> and you have this bottle of perfume, Chanel number no. 5. 
if you use it for example you know to have a nice scent about you or that perhaps before a certain ibadat you use the oud atar as we call it this is a good use of the perfume but a young man whose fancy turns somewhere else and uses that same perfume to try and do certain things that he is not supposed to do, that same use of that perfume becomes a bad thing. It was dependent on his niya by using the same perfume. The idea is something, and that indeed is a basis of niya and the action, the same action can be good or bad depending on your niya depending on your intention and therefore as we said before the blessed prophet said actions are evaluated according to the niya of a person and the most niya and the actions before god also have that low or high status before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if the intention of doing something is other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we stand up in prayers, we say qurbatan in Allah for the nearness of Allah, for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every act that I do, in fact, there is this terminology that part of the very fine level of shirk, the opposite of tawheed, to actually mix something with the divinity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is part and parcel of the wider shirk we are told that there is a very fine line of what we call shirk which is part and parcel of our thinking which is called riya the idea of riya is that even ibadah can become shirk when you do it for a purpose other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my ibadah that is out there for the show of the people my philanthropy is there on the basis that you know people may admire my philanthropy if the intention is not qurbatan in allah allah we pray that allah accepts everybody's action we don't know which action of ours is going to be accepted by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he only accepts maybe two rakats of prayers during my lifetime, maybe he will forgive me for the other transgressions. The idea is though that we need to continue to think. And the Blessed Prophet talked about Riyah. He gives a, he gives a beautiful simile as to what this shirk of Riyah is, as to how fine it is. And he says that this is a latent form of shirk. You can't see it. And it is as latent and as hidden, the Prophet says, as a black ant walking over a black stone on a black night. These are the words of the Blessed Prophet explaining the concept of Rhea as to how fine this line is that if, if at all there is that little thought that comes and, and Shaitan has his way of dealing with it that I get inflated with, a, with my own ego saying I did something good could well be that you may not even show it in your heart there is some level of ego that is showing to say this is but for other than Allah then that is considered as Riyah and therefore the idea of Riyah is very very important we know Bahlul and Fazl bin Rabi was a philanthropist in the time of Bahlul and there are two ways the story is told the more interesting one is that Fazl bin Rabi was then requested that you know he could put a plaque in the mosque, that he built the mosque. And Fazl bin Rabi said, No, 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 I don't need to put a I don't need to put a plaque on the mosque. I built it for Allah. And Bahlul, being the clever person that he was, goes and writes his own name saying Bahlul Mosque. So Fazl comes and he sees that and he goes, live it. He said, why did you write your name on my mosque, on the mosque that I helped build? So Bahlul says, what does it matter to you? You build the mosque for Allah. Allah knows that you build the mosque. What does it matter that I put my name there? The idea is that there was a latent concept of saying, I did something in the heart of Fazl bin Rabi. 
and Bahlul was able to show that this is a human failing that we need to really be careful about. And therefore, seeking the pleasure of Allah becomes one of the most important parts of our humanness in living our lives to the full potential. And this is a thanksgiving to Allah for His countless blessings and also for fulfilling the commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And when you have such a niyyah, when there is that purity of intention within a human being, then he further increases his blessings. I remember uh, Marhum Mullah Askar making the statement to say that I am not worried about my past deeds. When Allah gives me an opportunity to actually have a new deed, I know that my past deeds have been accepted. This is the blessing that we have with that clear intention. And therefore, this is something that we need to understand and this is the month of Muharram. We look at the Niyya of Yazid and Imam Hussain al You know, we talk about Baya and I wanted to bring this point. We talk about Baya. It's a rational exposition of Baya when Imam is asked to pay his oath of allegiance to Yazid. Most of the time we are told the Imam said that I will not pay allegiance to Yazid. Those are not the words that Imam used. Imam said exactly, he said, Mithli la yubayu mithlahu. It is not to say that I will not make bayah of Yazid, I refuse. Those were not the words that Imam used. We need to understand, we are critical thinkers, that every word of Aymal al has so many meanings. There are wider meanings. It is not merely saying, I am not going to make bayat of a tyrant. Imam said that my example, meaning a person like me, and then who is utterly submissive to Allah, cannot give his hand to the like of Yazid, who is an open sinner. So there is a much wider perspective to say, the likes of me cannot give bayat to the likes of him. And when that happens, that actually tells us that this is the basis of the niyyah of Imam Hussain al Islam to say that this is for all times that nowhere should his followers, nowhere should a human being give his oath of allegiance to someone who is like Yazid if you're going to be like Hussain. Salawat. <laughs> Why did Imam say this? We'll talk about Baya. So, here, the first premise is, Imam said, I am the manifestation of the truth. The Ahlul Bayt are those who have come to teach us the truth. And he said, Yazid is the manifestation of falsehood. And Imam says that a manifestation of the truth cannot unite with the manifestation of falsehood. Now here you have many times, we said there are gray areas, we really don't know. We, there are so many gray areas between what we try and do and what we ought to do. Where Karbala teaches us that there are no gray areas when it comes to truth and falsehood. We make adjustments because we are creative people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with the creative faculty called Kuwai Wahamiya, which comes together with Kuwai Akali and Kuwai Wahamiya, and we can twist things and justify things so much to ourselves. But when it comes to that idea of Niya, and our humanness, then that's the premise. So the conclusion was that I cannot agree to pay the oath of allegiance to the likes of Yazid. So having done the concept of Niyyah as we move on, we then come to the idea of Ibadah. And the idea of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and again it is a matter of understanding that action in obedience to Allah is ibadah. Any action that is done for the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is considered as ibadah provided it is done with a clear niyyah, it is done with khulus, it is done with sincerity. And therefore, I submit to you, Mumineen, that living a purposeful life means a clear niyyah, an intention of khulus, not just passing time in this world, and not just living for yourself. And this 
is something that one needs to understand. And this has been the theme to say, how can we regain our moral authority to be a civilizing force would only come through when we as individuals have understood the cardinal principles of niya, of intention, and making sure that I am living a purposeful life. What does it mean? A great student of a scholar finishes his studies, goes back to his village. And uh, after a few years, the teacher is curious to say what happened to my student. You know, for a teacher, the bright students are really the apple of their eyes, to say, my student. And he goes to the village where the student was, was living, and he goes to the townspeople and says, where is my student? He said, oh, he's, he's a great student. He's a great philosopher. And he is all the time so steeped in his thoughts. His taqwa is absolutely phenomenal. And he's such a pious person. But he said, where is he? He said, well, he lives in one corner away in the village and he doesn't visit us very often because he's so deeply spiritual and he's so much within himself. And he's contemplating. And he's such a good man and we serve him from time to time. So the teacher goes and starts talking to the student. And he said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I came back and I have so much to think about. I'm trying to write this book. I'm trying to research, I'm trying to perhaps look at the whole history of Kum's Chacha as to how this whole thing happened. And the idea was, the teacher says, let me give you a small parable. And he said, there are two ways, my son, that you can keep warm in the winter. One is that you have a big blanket around you or a big coat around you and you will keep warm in the, in, in the winter. But he said, you know the other way is that you go light a fire. You gather some wood and you go light a fire. And when you light a fire, everybody around you is going to benefit from that warmth. He said, that is what I taught you, my, my student, not to go and retire into this little place. I wanted you to go into society, live a purposeful life so that you're able to benefit your ill to the world at large. This is the meaning of living purposefully so that, you know, the idea is, and this is what we learn. We're here to, we're here to commemorate the martyrdom of Sayyid al-Shuhada and the other Shuhada who were with him. Shayyid al-Sad Butahari in his book, a wonderful book that is written about martyrdom, gives a fantastic simile, a metaphor about a martyr. And he said, you know what a Shaheed is? A Shaheed is somebody who recognizes the inevitability of his death while bringing light to the world at large just like a candle does. A candle burns itself to annihilation, but continues to give life, continues to give light to others. This is the meaning of us living purposefully. And therefore, when we look at the concept of Ibadah, truly it is a holistic concept which encompasses the full spectrum. The idea of sitting in a corner and reciting zikr and praying without being in, interactive in a society that you live in, without fulfilling your obligations to the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I said earlier, is something that needs to be really thought about because the fulfillment of both, the rights of Allah upon us and the rights of the creatures of Allah upon us are equally important. And therefore, I quote the Blessed Prophet when he said that to strive for the fulfillment of the Muslim's need is better than circumambulating, doing the tawaf of the Kaaba 70 times. Bihar al-Anwar. This bears thinking. Momini, it bears thinking. We have a fashion. We have a fashion. It's become the done thing now. I'm going to perform, and I'm not against Al Jazeera. Please don't misunderstand me. But I'm critically, I'm thinking critically. 
for myself and say, I have performed 20 Hajj. Every year I go for Hajj. Alhamdulillah, you have been able to go for Hajj. And you have circumambulated the Kaaba. But at the same time, have you also looked at the needs of those people from the very town and the village that you are living with? They have some needs that maybe one less Hajj, the five-star Hajj that you are making, maybe that one-star Hajj might be able to benefit a few people in your village. This is the concept where the, the rituals tend to take over and the practicality and the hukukul ibad tend to go down into the margins is where we can no longer be a civilizing force. All we can be is a ritualizing force. And this is a tendency that one needs to really think about. Because you know what? Allah is in need of nothing. He does not need your hajj. He does not need... When we are confronted with the choice between the two, Hukukullah and Hukukul Ibad, and I say this with the greatest of humility and a lot of trepidation so that I may not be misunderstood to say, let us think critically, Mominin. Let us convey this message to say that humanity needs us for us to be a civilizing force. We need to be interactive. And Alhamdulillah, we have many organizations today who have seen the light. They are doing it. But we need more and more of this that's coming through where we would be able to have, you know, this level of understanding that the creatures of God need to have their rights respected while God is in need of nothing. And if we are able to do that simple thing, then respecting the hukuk al ibad, and you know, this is not just a passive thing saying, yes, I, I respect your right to have clean water. I respect your right to have good health. And I sit there in my five bedroom home in Los Angeles and I say I really saw this on TV and I'm so so upset with this and then I go about my merry way on the golf course and I play golf and I come back and I've done nothing about it. I as a human being have a duty it's not an individualistic affair truly in order to work you know on the basis of social justice we truly have to understand you know what we have become we have become a society, and I say this about myself and not anyone else. We have become a society where we have pontification or action, but no action after the pontification. We will give advice on everything. We will have an opinion about everything that we have. And we will ask people, we are wishbones and sometimes jawbones. Some, we, the backbones that we need are far and few between. Alhamdulillah, at least those who are doing the great work, and there are many examples, who are doing the great work are keeping this, but what if maybe less than 5%? What if the other 95% join in this effort? We could truly be a civilizing force. You know, I'll give you an example. A man falls into a ditch. He falls into a hole. And different people pass by. An optimist passes by and he says things could have been worse, you know. And a pessimist comes and says things will get even worse. A philosopher comes and he says, you only you think you are in the hole in the pit. And a self-pitying person, a victim mentality person says, you ain't seen nothing until you've seen my pit. And a news reporter comes and he said, I'll get, try and get you out of the pit, but I want an exclusive story first. A politician comes, he promises to do something about it after the elections, of course. A mathematician comes and he calculates how the man fell into the pit. A scientist calculates the force necessary to get him out of the pit. A geologist told him to appreciate the rock strata that he was in there. A city inspector asked him, did you have permission, a permit to fall into the pit? An educationist gives him a lecture on the elementary principle of falling into the pit. My question is, what will you do? What will you do? If you understand Hukukulibad, he doesn't need all these things. He doesn't need all the optimists and the pessimists and the people. What he needs is somebody to hold his hand, take him by the hand, lift him out of the pit because you are a caring person, because you are somebody who understands Hukukulibad. What he most needs now is to pull him out of that pit. That's what he needs. And this is something 
that we need to understand that it's become a society of what we call pontification. <clears throat> so, life happens at the level of action, not at the level of thought, neither at the level of the circumstance nor of emotion. There needs to be action if we are to say that we want to reclaim us as a civilizing force, then publishing books while they are good will not cut it. Creating websites of who is Hussein, by the way, it's a great website which has been created. Wonderful website. It's a, there are placards on buses and all that all over in Chicago, in London, and I think you should go and check that site out. It says who is Hussein.org. The point is, all the publicity that we do about who Imam Hussein al Islam is, which is a good thing, is not going to cut it unless we do something in the name of Imam Abdullah, Imam Hussein al Islam. That there are projects, and Alhamdulillah, things are happening, but as I said, we need to do much more. So, this is what Malana Rum said on this. said, Ya Allah, let us not be those content to wait, to wait and see what will happen but grant us the determination to make the right things happen. And brothers who are in the other town are your Shia. So Imam asked him to say they are our Shia. Well, how were you? How were your brothers when you took leave of them? And he said, do the rich visit the indigent when they fall ill? And the men say, well, they seldom do. And Imam said, do the rich seek to know the condition of those who are poor? The man says, rarely. And the Imam says, do the affluent ones help out the poor and the needy? And the man says, you speak of attributes which are rare amongst our people. And Imam says, and this is reported in Al-Kafi, then how do these people consider themselves to be our Shia? This is the meaning, more meaning of living purposefully with a message, but at the same time, we need to have the level of action. And I repeat this Hadith al Qudsi where Allah, the Prophet said that Allah will ask, O son of Adam, I fell ill and you visited me not. And the slave will say, O Lord, how should I visit you when you are the Lord of the worlds? And the response comes to say that, but when you, if you had visited the one who was sick, who was ill, then you would have found me there because I was with him. And the questions in the Hadith of Kusli were asked to say, when I asked you for food, you fed me not. The same answer comes, that if you had, then it is as if that you would have fed me. It was son of Adam, I asked you to give me drink, but you gave me not to drink, Allah says. And the same question is asked, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you had given drink, it is as if that you would have quenched my thirst. So, it's not really about money. Imam Jafar Sadiq al-Islam says, and I quote, that generosity is characteristic of the prophets. It is a pillar of faith, and a believer cannot be other than be generous. So it's not really about the money, it's actually about the heart. It's about living purposefully, where real generosity is not dependent on how much you have. It is how desirous you are to actually give even the smallest of it. And when somebody asks the Blessed Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, I don't have the means. What good deed can I do? He said, removing a stone which is an impediment on the path of the people is also considered charity. A smile when you do a smile to a person is also considered charity. The idea is to imbibe that level of goodness within us, Mominin, to actually see that we are able to live our lives purposefully. Inshallah, we will continue with this theme tomorrow because I have not been able to finish. I will stop here at this point in time. We will continue with the idea of that humanness that we have and what is it that makes me what I am? Tonight, traditionally, we remember that personality whose goodness finally showed up. It was his nafs al the self-blaming soul, within Hazrat al that rises up and he's contemplating on the day of Ashur. 
What have I done? What have I done to have brought Imam Hussain al Islam here? What was I thinking? What was happening to me? And uh, when people asked him, I uh, said, Oh, Hor, we are, you are a brave man. We have never seen you in this state of emotion, in this state of fright. And he said, you know what? I'm, I'm seeing hell on one side. I'm seeing Jahannam on one side. And I'm seeing Jannah on one side. And I am really within its line of trepidation. Momin, we have heard many, many times as to how Hazrat the Hor, with his sons and his brother, walks over towards the Khaimah of Imam Hussain al Islam in a state of forgiveness and magnanimity. Imam Hussain al Islam receives Hazrat the Hor with the generosity. This was a man who had brought him here, and he receives him with the greatest of generosity. And when Hor asks to go out into the battlefield, Hur is the one who goes out and fights in the battlefield. It is said that amongst the many that Imam Hussain al-Islam could not go to the maktal, Hur was one of those where Imam rushes to the assistance of Hazrat the Hur when he was breathing his last. Momin, these are the examples of goodness and living purposefully even at the last moment and the idea of forgiveness in our faith that we learn from Hazrat the Hur. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiwa. If I lose my family and friend And my life's coming to an end If I lose my feet and hands If I can no longer stand If I stumbled a thousand times if the journey's a thousand miles, I will come crawling to you, Hussein. I will come crawling to you, Hussein.